So, question number one, women, who is considered to be the most gifted person of the last century? The last century, you, you raise your hand if you got an answer. Gifted. The most gifted person of the last century. Who is widely considered to be the most gifted person of the last 100 years? Yes, right here. Mother Teresa is a great answer. Anyone else? Anyone else? Jessica? Ellen DeGeneres? Ellen DeGeneres! Just behind Mother Teresa. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Anyone else, please? Me and Angela. Me and Angela? I'm going to give you guys a hint. She's looking at me. Huh? All right, this is a little bit of a, a ringer question. So, ladies, the correct answer is your child. Uh, ah. Uh, <laughs> ah, mom. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Question number two. See if you can complete this pearl of motherly wisdom. When you marry the man, you marry the woman. Family. Family. Oh. Family. Who said it first? Stephanie back there, correct. Greg, and we have a prize. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a prize that is a mother's relaxation kit. <laughs> Question number three. Here is a mom survival scenario. See if you can figure it out. You're at the mall. Why is your toddler crying? Is it A, no quarters for the coin operated rocket ship ride? B, you won't buy her an entire cookie cake? C, she's afraid of the auto flush toilets? <laughs> or D, it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. Just impressed that you're not crying also. <laughs> was there an end? Was there a first answer? <laughs> Who said it? I got it again. Stop. You thought it was Linda? Linda gets it. Linda gets a, a, a mother's fuel coffee cup. All right. All right, now here we go. This is where this is where we're moving into our final phase. So you got me ready to. Shoot your hand up here. Question number four. This movie mom married a Jedi who later turned to the dark side. Is it A, Padme Amidala, B, Leia Skywalker, three, Asajj Ventress, or four, Ahsoka Tano? Oh, read that in the back. First, <laughs> first but you were right behind her. Okay, bonus round. Here we go. Now I'm, I'm going to look for the first hand that goes into the air. This mom was an American actress who married a European prince. A. There we go.
you can kind of simulate contractions to show what your wife went through on your day. That sounds fun. <laughs> what we're going to look you up right now. Okay. Go ahead, make it Okay. What we're doing right now is we're looking at the action monitor. It reminds me of those uh, episodes from the C-Tech. Right, C-Tech? Got it? I'm going to have a six-pack after this. You were basically going to electrocute us for an hour? Yes. You're very small. Just right here in your abdomen. Hi, ladies. Hi. Here you are. Take vengeance on him to basically take out his own 
uh, son-in-law, and of course some of you are thinking, man, I've, I've got to visit the in-laws this weekend, and, and I'm telling you, no matter how bad they are, they're not as bad as Saul. Like, I, I know you think they might want to kill you and take you out, but, uh, but this is actually happening in David's life. He's got a father-in-law who's, who's out to kill him, out to take him out, and so he's in Ziklag, uh, which is a town that's just beyond the border of the nation of Israel, just beyond the reach of Saul. And of course, this has been years now. And so at this point, he's, uh, David's actually been able to create quite a following of his own. Uh, he has about 600 men who joined him at Ziklag. These are his boys. This is his crew. And, and they're with him for a couple of reasons. Uh, they're with him, one, because they recognize that, that he's been anointed to be the next king of Israel. Uh, he is the heir apparent for Saul. Um, but there's also another reason of why uh, they follow him, why they're joining him at Ziklag. And that's because, to, to be real honest with this, is that they're expecting a promotion. They're expecting to get something out of this. He's going to be the next king. And they're hoping that out of their service, out of their following, that, that, that they'll get you know, um, some, some promotion. Maybe they'll get opportunity. They'll at the very least get a gift card out of this deal. But they're, they're following David. Um, to try to get some stuff out of it. And here's the downside of this, is that as, as David is going to find out in just a moment, when he runs out of stuff he can do for them, he's also about to run out of friends. <laughs> and, uh, and for right now, though, he's got some men, he's got some land, he's at this place called Ziklag, and here we find him about to do the dip. He's gone left, he's gone right, he's gone front, he's gone back, and now it's time to dip. And this is where we... We join in in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 3 through 4. Uh, they're coming back from Ziklag. All 600 guys, uh, David took them out uh, to kind of go on this excursion, on this uh, little military campaign. And, and this is kind of what they come back to. And it says, when David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Wow, talk about, talk about being overwhelmed. And talk about being overwhelmed with, with grief, overwhelmed with loss. You know, we talked about a couple weeks ago how I, I think it's a misnomer uh, that, that, that the strong, you know, that those who maybe have been in church for a while or have followed God for a while, that, that we as believers, we never get overwhelmed. You know, it's kind of that, that, that false um, uh, kind of uh, statement that's oftentimes given out there that, that God will never give you more than you can handle, which is totally just not true. In fact, you just read throughout Scripture, you see time and time again people giving way more than they can handle. Because if you could handle it on your own, you wouldn't need God. And so this is the very situation we see these guys. I mean, we see strong guys, tough guys. I mean, these were trained killers. These were guys with a special set of skills. And, and they're broken. And they're... They're, they're grieving, they're, they're overwhelmed by loss, they're overwhelmed at the idea their business is gone, their family's gone, their future's gone. And they weren't alone in this either. Even David, there's this man after God's own heart, there's this worshiper of God, this warrior of God, he, he as well is overwhelmed. We see this in verse 6, it says, David was, was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit. Because of his sons and daughters. Right, so, so again, you gotta, gotta kind of paint the scene here in your mind. Here David, he's, he's trying to kind of you know, encourage his troops in a lot of ways. He's trying to kind of do his best to sort of rally them. But, but not only were they not saying amen at this time, uh, they were looking at them with, arm, looking at them with arms crossed. And, and it was almost kind of like, hey, preach at me. Do your best job. Preach at me. Preach. See if you can preach me out of this situation. And, and here's David. And, and again, at face with this, looking at this group of men who are just bitter, they're brokenhearted because of their sons and their daughters, because of such loss. And, and yet I love what David does here. Look at this in verse 6. It says, David, David found strength in the Lord his God. David found strength in the Lord his God. I love that how the King James Version puts it. It says uh, that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Encouraged himself in the Lord. So you see, the question in your life and mine, it's not, it's not what you do to dip. The, the dips are going to come. In your spiritual growth, in your spiritual maturity, in just your walk with Christ in life, dips are going to come. The question is not whether you're going to have a dip. The question is how will you dip when it comes? 
How do you do the dip? It's, the question isn't whether there's going to be tragedy or there's going to be downturn or there's going to be heartache or there's going to be brokenness or, or whether you're going to get overwhelmed in life. It's how are you going to respond in that moment? How are you going to respond and do the dip? David put it this way in Psalm 23. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Key word there is you're going to go through some stuff. <laughs> You're guaranteed that, that, that go through some trials, go through some challenges. It's not a matter of will you go through the dip, but how you go through the dip. And, and I love David because David, he decided that he was going to dip differently. He was going to dip differently. Now, now in saying this, I, listen, I found that, I think that, and I think it's important to highlight this, is that I found that one of the greatest mistakes you can make in life is to decide how to dip while you're dipping. It is to wait till you're in that moment to make this decision of, man, how am I going to respond? How am I going to decide to dip? To, to try to make decisions that require the greatest of care when we're in the worst of conditions. And yet, when you think about it, how many of us do this? You know, we'll make, our, make decisions about our marriages in the dip. We'll, we'll make decisions about our spirituality in the dip. We'll make decisions about the business in the dip. There are those times where we're most discouraged, we're most, most deflated, we're most de de depleted, we're most depressed, we're most distressed. The times when there's people that, that seem like those that are, are closest to us just want to throw rocks or, or they, they hate your guts or they're emotional. And, and listen, the danger of this, when we choose to make decisions of a major proportion in the dip, I'm telling you, when you make decisions in the dip, nine times out of ten, they'll, they'll be the worst decisions of your life. Nine times out of ten, they will be the worst decisions of your life. I mean, again, think about these guys. I mean, here, here are these guys, that, again, yeah, they followed David because, because he was anointed. They knew he was going to be the next successor, but they were hoping to get something out of this deal. And yet, it's amazing how these men, they were ready to kill David. They were ready to kill and stone the very guy, you know, Israel, who would come to become Israel's greatest king, the very guy who would eventually promote them and create opportunity, yet they almost killed it all in the heat of the moment, in, in the middle of the dip, but not David. See, again, David dipped differently. The reason David dipped differently is David made a decision about what to do in the dip before he ever got to the dip. Because I read one place where David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. I'm going to bless him regardless of what I'm going through, regardless of the day. I'm choosing to bless the Lord at all times. No he didn't say with good times in mind. Because listen, no, nobody, nobody has to say, 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 I will bless the Lord in good times as if that's a challenge. And in fact, you, you can halfway believe in God and sit there and say, man, thank you, God, for you know, opening up this job opportunity or delivering this house. I mean, yeah, I mean nobody has to do that in the moment. No, no, the times, what David says, how David did the dip was David said, no, I, I will bless the Lord at all times, assuming that not all times are good times. Even in the hard times, even in the difficult times, even in the bad times, I'm choosing before I even get into the dip, I'm going to worship my God, I'm going to serve my God, I'm going to follow my God. Amen. See, it's a choice beforehand. you, you got to say, you got to be able to get that place. I will bless the Lord at all times. Bless the Lord at all times. And so here's, here's David. He's, he's, he's decided to how he's going to respond to the dip before he gets to the dip. And, and again, it's the same with us. You've got to decide how to deal with the dip before you ever even experience the dip. And, and David decides, I'm going to do the dip differently. Now, as men, on the other hand, they do what most people do. Most people, when they're in the dip, they blame people. They're, they're looking around at, at someone to blame, and David becomes a scapegoat. And, and listen, can we be real, real and honest with this story? Is actually they had good reason to kind of put David as a scapegoat because it was probably David's fault. I mean, think about it. you have six hundred men, David, six hundred men, and you decide to take all of the, your men on this excursion. Leaving your town, leaving your wives, leaving your kids, leaving your business totally exposed to attack. And so as a result, they, they start to blame David. See, the men found fault in David, but David found strength in the Lord. As I found this, and I think this is so true, is that you and I in our lives, we can either find fault in people 
where I can find strength in the Lord, but, but listen, I'm telling you, you can't do both at the same time. You can't do both at the same time. And, and look, I'm not saying there's not fault to be found. If you want to find it, you can find it. If they're people, they got faults. So you can find it. But, but listen, if I spend the rest of the rest of this year, if I spend the rest of 2019, you're trying to find out whose fault January was or April was, I will miss the opportunity to find the strength that I didn't even know I had. I didn't even know I had. And that's what we see in, in David's life. Again, verse 6, it says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. That again, that, that version, he encouraged himself. He encouraged himself in the Lord. So here's the first thing. Listen, how do you and I begin to overcome being overwhelmed? Number one is you've got to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. You've got to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. And listen, I'm not talking about you going and then getting on Facebook and talking to, to everyone and anyone else or somebody else. But, but I'm talking about specifically what do you say when you talk to yourself? What do you say when you talk to yourself? Because listen, all of us, we talk to ourselves. And now, you know, I mean, like, well, that seems a little crazy. But listen, you're only crazy if you start answering yourself. <laughs> but, but we all talk to ourselves, right? And so the question is, what do you say when you talk to yourself? Do you encourage yourself in the Lord? Do you build yourself up by speaking his word, his promises, his praise over your life? David said, again, I will bless the Lord at all times. In other words, I, I've already decided before I get in, in, into, this, into this dip, I've already decided uh, some of the words I'm going to speak over my life. I've already decided that I'm not going to give up when the times get tough. I've already decided that when the relationship it hits a dip where we're not, you know, divorce is not an option for us, we've already decided. And listen, for, for some of us, to overcome what's overwhelming you, it begins with talking to yourself encouraging yourself rather than just always listening to yourself. Listening to your feelings in the moment, to, to the fear in the moment, to the anger in the moment, to the doubts in the moment. See, see, I, 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 think, I think sometimes we, we can have this tendency to, to sort of, you know, underestimate sort of the power of our words, especially when we're in a dip. The power of our words, especially when we're in a dip. The Bible 